Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. In this episode, I will be reviewing three wines from the Rias Baixas region of Spain. All three of these are Albarinos. This is the penultimate episode of Elite Wine TV. Don't get to say that word very often. So where is Rias Baixas? Glad you asked. So Rias Baixas is in the northwest corner of Spain, just above Portugal, which you will be able to see just across the yellow border at the bottom of the screen. It is an area called Galicia or Galicia, and there's five subzones. Starting at the north, it's Ribera do Ula, Val do Sanes, Sotomayor, O Rosal, and Condado do Te. Across Portuguese border, the grape is known as Alvarinho. It's one of the two main white grapes that's used for Vino Verde. There are actually quite a few white grapes that are allowed, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about Spain. So Albarinos from Spain are very refreshing and they tend to have some really good floral notes and some really good salinity. It's perfect for seafood pairing and of course being right on the Atlantic, there is plenty of seafood to pair with it. So let's get into the wines. First up is the 2018 Burgons. Suggest the retail price when I can tell is 15 bucks. They didn't really give me the retail prices. I'll ask them, maybe I'll get that updated in the uh, lower thirds. But I'll, I'll send an email out to him and say, hey, you didn't give them to me, but this is what I found out just to make sure everything's correct. Uh, this one is probably the most familiar of the three, at least it is for me. Uh, this is a custom cuvee for European sellers made by Martin Kodaks, which is the largest cooperative in Rias Baixas. It was founded in 1986 by about 50 families with small plots of Albarino around the village's Combados. It is grown to include almost 600 families and well over 3,000 small parcels of Albarino. Now, Martin Kodaks has invested in a team of viticulturalists who make regular visits to the vineyards to educate the members on proper farming techniques and sustainable practices. That includes the use of cover crops to help fix nitrogen in the sandy granitic soils. They also host a daily radio broadcast in the region as well to encourage uh, best practices and pay their members based upon the quality of the fruit rather than quantity. All the vineyards are located in the Sanes subzone of the Appalachian, and the, which is the coolest and most humid of the regions within, within Rias Baixas. So in the cellar, uh, the wines are fermented and aged in temperature controlled stainless steel tanks to preserve freshness and the bracing acidity that's usually typical of Albarino grown in the Sanes. Each vintage, they also have several experimental fermentations conducted with uh, conducted to understand the minor variations of site, the role of natural yeast, the length of elevage, and the applicability of different fermentation vessels. All of these experiments are used to improve the quality of the wines with each successive vintage. Okay, so here are the stats for this wine. So like I said, the vintage is 2018. Suggested retail about 15 bucks. 100% Albarino. They do sustainable farming. The age of the vines is about 20 years plus. Soil is granite, schist, and sand. Elevation, 10 to 150 meters. That's 33 to about 400 to maybe 500 feet. Harvesting methods, hand harvested. Fermentation, stainless steel. Aging in three months in tank with the leaves being stirred. So let's get into this wine. Get to use my screw cap on the Corbin. It's been a miss since I had the Burgons. <clears throat> like I said, this is the one that I'm most familiar with. And Martin Kodaks. They're like the two big ones that everybody knows. And they're in that 15-ish or less uh, price point from what I've seen out in the, out in the market. All righty. 
So I'm getting some citrus, mostly orange, really, but I also get a little bit of lemon lime. A touch of sea salt. That salinity is starting to come through a little bit more. I don't get as much florals as I typically get from Albarino's. There's a bit of spice though to it. And like I had an, I had a uh, Albarino, no, sorry, I had a, um, it was a different wine. It wasn't Albarino. It was a Torontes. Those are super floral and spice driven. But um, you can get some florals also from Albarino. There's a little bit of, I would almost call white pepper. So Albarino is kind of like what we call the Bermuda Triangle of the somewhat neutral wines. So you'll have Albarino, Gruner Veltliner, which white pepper is actually a huge component sometimes. And you can then include Pinot Grigio in that. I've seen people include things like Gewürztraminer and um, Sauvignon Blanc, but they're not really part of that triangle. It's really just Pinot Grigio or Pinot Gris. Gewürztraminer, not Gewürztraminer, Gruner Veltliner, the other G, and Albarino. So these rate these wines tend to confuse people on blind tastings. So I mean on the nose, I could see in my head on a blind tasting kind of going in the is this gruner because there is a bit of pepperiness to it. But sometimes there's a bit of salinity, there's some of that orange, which I don't normally get from gruner. I do get a little bit of lemon lime, which I can get from Pinot Grigio or Pinot Gris. Let's go and taste the wine. So let's continue that Bermuda Triangle of things. So there's not a lot of white pepper, but I can see this peppery spiciness to it. But it's also prickly. And I think that's where maybe people are confusing is the acidity in here that's giving me that prickliness, but also get a little bit of salinity. Salinity doesn't usually happen in Gruner and in Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio. So that's where you start going, okay, maybe this is more Albarino. Orange for me is the predominant citrus flavor. Again, that's not a flavor I normally get with Gruner and Pinot Grigio, but I can also see a little bit of green apple in there. I can also see a little bit of lemon lime, but orange is probably the one that's the most prominent, but it's still pretty light. There's also a little bit of weight to it, and that's from the least stirring. It's not a lot of least contact, but the least stirring helps really give extra bit of contact with the wine. You don't normally get Lee's contact with Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio from Alsace, I, I just can't think of it being done, but I'm not saying it's not. And Gruner, it could be done, I guess, but for me, it's not something that's something I usually see in tasting notes. Even with Albarino, I don't always see Lee's stirring, but this gives it a little bit of extra weight and body. And that would probably take me away from Pinot Grigio, at least as far as Italy. Though Pinot Gris has a little bit of kind of richness in body, but that's really more from ripeness of fruit because they have a lot of sunshine hours and not from necessarily lees stirring. I also don't really get that type of, well, people talk like the stale beer, which lees stirring can do, or aut autolysis, which you can maybe get some bakery or pasta notes out of it. So... I don't really get that, but I feel like there's a little bit of weight to the wine. It's a good wine. And like I said, this is the one that I see more than any other one. I'm actually not familiar with these two, but I'm about to get familiar with them. So let's move on to wine number two. All right. So next is the 2019 Bodegas Laval Albarino. From what I can tell, about 14 bucks retail. The winery was founded in 1985 by Jose Limerez Gil. I'm assuming I pronounced the last name right. It was one of the wineries that helped establish the Rias Baixas Dio in 1988. And then in 2010, there was an ownership change where the Limerez family became a minority owner instead. 
Let's fly away from Martin Codex. We're going to head over to Condado Dote region of Galicia. Just so you know, to the left is Orosal in the yellow. This is where Bodegas Laval is. And just to point out that the shaded areas are kind of a freehand drawing. They aren't precisely correct. As we get a close-up of the Bodegas, I'm going to put the shading back in, and you're going to see that I cut off about half the vineyard. So... Yeah, it's, it's not precise, but you get a general idea of where all these areas are. Now, we're going to get hopefully a close-up of one of the vineyards, or at least show you where it is, Arante. The other two, I'm not sure exactly where they're at, but I, I looked up Arante, and this seems like this is where that vineyard is. So the grapes come from the Tabojea, Arante, and Porto vineyards in the south part of the region. Harvest is mid September, and it's a manual harvest. 70% of the grapes are macerated for six hours at a controlled temperature of 8 to 10 degrees Celsius, about 46 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and then they're pressed. The fermentation takes place in stainless steel tanks at controlled temperature for two to three weeks. So here are the stats, though my teleprompter says states. For the wine, I kind of already said all these things again, but again, 2019, it's 14 bucks, 100% Albarino, hand harvested, stainless steel fermentation. They say on their tech sheet that their suggested drinking window is four years after harvest. So between now and four years after harvest. So let's get into this wine. The screw cap, I love screw caps. They are my favorite enclosure. Though with the Corvin, you can only last really three months, but I've, I've taken a wine to five and a half months and it still tastes pretty darn good. And this has enough acidity, even though I don't have the acid stats on these. This has enough acidity to like last for a while. So I can see one of these lasting like five months as far as a screw cap. Corbin, under the cork, pretty much I've gone up to 18 months with a red wine. So that should be enough, though. I just popped, popped the canister on that. That should be enough to evaluate the wine. So I'm really excited to try this wine since I'm not familiar with it. So for me, the orange, and that's one of the things that kind of gives me a clue this is Albarino versus some other stuff. I'm not saying no other white wines have orange, but when I'm starting to like narrow the world down, when orange is the first fruit that I smell, I usually throw out a ton of other wines, especially if it smells like this really clean, unoaked, somewhat salinity, somewhat crisp and and carbonated, I guess. There, there's a there's this aroma I get from certain wines that don't see oak, but it's 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 hard to describe. But anyway, orange. It's a prickliness to it. Somewhat of a salinity. There's also a there's a little, there, I find there's a little more floral on this. So white flowers, almost like this white potpourri. Like you kind of walked into the flower shop, but it's all the brighter, lighter, whiter flowers, not like the reds and purples. There's a bit of sea funk, actually. Oh, wow. There's like a little bit of sea funk. Like not just salinity, but like when you get near the coast and you can smell the ocean. I kind of smelled that. I don't know if I'm looking for that and I get it, or it's actually in the wine. All right, let's check it out. So besides the orange, I'm getting a little grapefruit on this. So grapefruit is a really big like thing for Sauvignon Blanc. I could see someone kind of putting this in the Sauvignon Blanc side of things. I mentioned with the last one, sometimes Sauvignon Blanc and Albarino are confused because you can have a high acidity and you get these fruit and these citrus flavors and aromas. Um, there's a touch of grapefruit in this, but the orange is still there. There's a bit of grassiness to it, a bit of, I feel like oregano, tarragon type of thing. 
So that would also confuse me in thinking this could be Gruner because Gruner can have some vegetal and some herb herbaceous, not vegetal, but herbaceous, herbaceous stuff. It can have some vegetal too. But the fruits really bring me back in that, that it, I don't get that sea aroma. I get more of the salinity, a little saltiness. That brings me back to going, this is probably Albarino if I was doing a blind. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of like you salted the grapefruit or salted the orange. Lightly salted. Yeah. I know we didn't talk about with this wine. All these wines are going to be like seafood pairing, but, and I don't eat seafood, but I kind of understand how the seafood would work. So if you had like a really simple like grilled shrimp with like some lime, lime juice and lemon juice, that type of stuff, even if you were like getting fancy, like orange, uh, squeeze some orange over it or have some type of citrus sauce type of thing. Ceviche, right? I don't know. I don't eat, I don't eat seafood, but I can see that that going really well with that type of stuff. All right. So let's do wine number three. So finally, we have the 2018 Signorio de Rubios Robalino Abreño. Figures around 18 bucks. Not a whole lot in this winery I could find. It appears to be a co-op that was found in 2003 from a group of about 57 people, and they currently have 105 partners. We're going to stay over in Condado Dote and take a short little flight over to Signorio de Rubios. Looks to be pretty hilly over here versus a couple of the other places we are at. And then we're going to pull back so that you can see the whole Rias Baixas area one more time. And let's just get into the stats. Uh, it's a 2018. Figure it's 18 bucks from what I can tell. 100% Albarino. Harvested is hand harvested. Alcohol by volume is 12.6%. Total acidity 5.6 grams per liter. And the pH is 3.4. The residual sugar, or they have it listed as reducing sugars, is 1.4 grams per liter. So let's get into this wine. But before I do that, I need to change the capsule. So we'll, we'll cut here. All right. So now that I've swapped cartridges. So as you can tell, I, I do little cuts here and there. At least that's what I'm doing this episode and last episode. And that's what the new show is going to be like. And that's really just to kind of move things along, which I'm going to talk about next week anyway. So I'm not going to talk about too much right now. But as you can see, the reviews are uncut. All right. Or unedited. Not, not edited. Let's check it out. Orange again, but it's really faint. Like, I mean, I'm trying not to swirl the wine first, though the last two I did that. I'm trying to let the aromas just kind of hit the glass and kind of go up. Somewhat peach-like, too. Let's see if we swirl it and get anything out of it. It's almost like a creamsicle. Though there's no, van why there's vanilla in here? There shouldn't be, but there's no wood. So maybe I'm just getting, I'm imagining it because the orange was kind of a richer orange. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty much, that's it. There's not much else going on in the aroma. Again, Albarino can be a pretty neutral wine. It's just refreshing and easy to drink and goes with a lot of you know, like lighter foods, salads, seafood, that type of stuff. You can do it with chicken. Just don't have like heavily, so put like heavy sauce on the chicken. You know, something really simple. A little bit of white flowers, kind of a peachy aroma. Let's just taste it. It 
it's a really tart orange with some peach and white peach that's slightly underripe. The acidity's really, really hitting me. So there's a lot of tartness to it. This is something that I would definitely not confuse with Gruner. At least I don't think I would. It's always different when you actually do the blind tasting. And I'm pretty sure I wouldn't confuse this with Pinot Grigio or even Pinot Gris. I probably would be really thinking it's Albarino, or at least it's one of the grapes I'm thinking about. But at the same time, kind of like doing the analysis, going it could be one of the other two, or it could be something completely different. There's a slight under-ripeness to it. You guys have that tartness, that crispness to it, along with the acidity. I like the wine. I think I like these two better. This is not a bad wine at all. It's a really good wine. But I, I kind of think I prefer these. But, I mean, it's still a good wine. Now, these have warmed up. They were in the fridge all the way through the, you know, through the end of last week's episode. I didn't pull them out of the fridge until I was getting prepared for this one. And I did like rehearsal with the uh, teleprompter. Really just make sure there was nothing in the teleprompter that was like really bad other than a few misspelled words that I just glossed over anyway. There's a richness to it. That creamsicle still kind of coming through. So I'm not sure where that's actually coming from based upon the based upon what we know about the wine uh, with stainless steel. Did we don't talk? There's no talk of. I mean, I'm just looking at the notes real quick. There's no talk of of um, how much and how long in stainless steel it is. If there's lees stirring or anything like that, or if there's, I mean, there's usually no wood involved with Albarino for the most part. But maybe there was a little bit of wood. Maybe it was used wood. I don't know. It tastes really good. But I do prefer the other two. But hey, you may like this one better than the others. That's the thing. Because I like one wine more than another doesn't mean that the other wine isn't as good. It could be actually be a better wine. It could be just that today, on this tasting... I prefer something else over another wine. That's what happens with these things. Especially when the wines are very similar, uh, similar quality level, similar flavors, especially stuff like Albarino, which can have a, um, well, a lot of wines from regions can have a, I don't want to use the word sameness, but um, a similarity to them. They should all taste relatively the same, and you'll get some variations based upon the type of winemaking practices that are being done. So with that said, at any point in time, one wine may show better than another on any particular day. And it, got, it may not even be anything in the wine. It could be just your personality, your feelings and thoughts that day, your attitude. You had a good day, a bad day, an indifferent day, that type of stuff. Anyway, that's just a really long way to say just because I prefer these two over this one doesn't mean that tomorrow I won't prefer this one over the others because it's happened. Anyway, that, you know... That's, this is a good time to end the show. So that's going to do it for this episode. If you like this episode, please make sure that you hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Besides that, the best thing you can do is tell your friends about the show. And then I'll also have links to all three wineries in the description along with affiliate links for a lot of the equipment I use to produce the show. And then... Next week, stay tuned for the last episode of Elite Wine TV.